Welcome to the Homeschool Together podcast. Where one working mom and a stay-at-home dad help you navigate the nuts and bolts of the growing and dynamic world of homeschooling. With a focus on early learners. Like me! All the ins and outs of building and maintaining your homeschool life. Homeschool! Find out tips and tricks to make things like this easier. I'm reading! And ultimately, enjoy educating your kids. And what's that last thing? Have fun together! Did I do good, Daddy? (laughs) Yeah, you did, sweetie. Good job. Hello and welcome back to Homeschool Together. Head down into the show notes if you have a moment to get a couple nice links there to support the podcast and also leave a review. And if you could share it with a friend out there who may be interested in homeschooling next year or somebody who is just new to homeschooling, because today's episode is a another good one where it's a first year homeschooler. And I think I think well, I I wouldn't say no. She was like she had been homeschooling a couple of years. Homeschooling for a few years, yeah, 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 about two two here. But this homeschool journey is another one of our homeschool journeys interview, and I and we love these so much because uh, it really helps us see the whole breadth of homeschooling possibilities. I just love to hear from families actually doing it, and you know their their reasons for getting into it and and thriving. Yeah, and and you know why it was the right decision for their family, how it looks for their family. It's not like there's a homeschooling playbook out there that no. everybody's looks the same. So that's why I really love these interviews. And, and hopefully you're listening out there. You might be able to see a piece of yourself in these interviews. Um, and, and that's why we do them. I think they're so informative. I learned something from every single interview we've done. Exactly. And today's interview is with Jenna McIntyre. Um, she's a homeschooling mom of two, um, really focusing on her, her oldest uh, child. Uh, her youngest, I think, is still in preschool level. Mm-hmm. Um, but her oldest had... Um, neurodiverse as well, and um, had speech apraxia. This is something I had never heard about. Yeah, um, and about when we that. we talked with her in the background, we had to do some research on that, and that's something that you know we're not familiar with. Um, and it's basically the ability in, to communicate between the mind and the mouth to actually have the right words come out in the right the right order. Um, and this is a you know a, an issue that her her son had to deal with, and and she as a homeschooling parent had to work her child through through the process of teaching him how to right. to think about what he's going to speak um there are uh like games uh she talks a lot about using her ipad there's a a voice assistant right um, yeah, kind of he, an automated he has, voice assistant he has, a, he has problems forming the words and then when he does yeah. they're really difficult to understand yeah, for and, a lot of people and, and, and that can be so frustrating for him and as she's you know w- you know working through the apraxia um she begins to homeschool and she's doing homeschooling mm-hmm. she's i think uh um, build your library. She's doing the around the world journey, um, as well as um, a number of other homeschooling curriculums. Uh, I think logic of English, um, and she's. I think she's doing right start if I'm right. Um, so she's doing all the homeschooling, but also this added um, element of of helping her son um, communicate um, yeah. um, in an effective manner, and 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 the frustration that that comes from not just not on just her side, you know, trying to work through as a teacher. We all have frustrations with our children. But his frustration having to deal with the emotions of him trying to communicate and, and right. say the things having, he wants to say, yeah. Yeah, I can't imagine having these complex thoughts and just not being able to really get them out there and, and what a struggle that that would be. Yeah. So, you know, and she talks a bit about his journey and, and how much yeah. uh, how much he's grown mm-hmm. um, and, and how much that's changed for them. And it's, it's, really, it's really great to hear the progress yeah. that he's made, you know, with the care. And, and he has some outside therapy therapies that he does she talks about that um, as well. That she talks about but it's really great it's great to see that how homeschooling is working for their family and mm. how it's helping him be able to you know properly express himself and be in an environment that's supportive and they do go to a co-op and he has made friends and yeah you know he's living, living this, normal, the normal life yeah, yeah this a, a really full and rich educational experience yeah. and social experience for him yeah so. it was a wonderful interview with jenna mcintyre and we hope you guys enjoy it as well Hi, Jenna. Thank you so much for coming on our show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. This is, it's really interesting. It's a totally new thing for me. (laughs) I know, right? She's seen seen behind behind the curtain. She's seen us. That's right. Yeah, she can see us. Uh, Sorry, you podcast listeners, uh, you can't see us, but it is nice to to see your face and meet you. And so Mm -hmm. so tell us a bit about your family. Give us some, uh, and our listeners, some background on you. 
So our family is kind of a amalgamation. <laughs> We're kind of a yours, mine, and our set. Yeah. Oh. Um, we have our oldest son is 24, and I met him when he was about 11, and I adopted him at 16. So he was my husband's. Um, and he's mine now because I, I signed the papers and everything. <laughs> um and I had a I have a 16 year old. Um and he was three when we met, when we kind of joined together and mm-hmm. when we met. And then my husband and I together have a five and a half and three and a half year old. So we have two very, very busy, busy littles at home. <laughs> and then teenage funk. <laughs> That's quite the dynamic. So what what drove you all to, to homeschool? What was that process like for you? We did not homeschool our older kids. Mm-hmm. Um, our 24-year-old went through public school, went to the STEM high school, and graduated um, when I was hugely pregnant with the five-year-old. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and our 16-year-old goes to public high school and is very much public high school in a couple of clubs and sports and crazy busy on his world over there. But I have, I have a background in education. I have a dual degree in both special education for K-12 and elementary education K-5, which means that I can read things and think I know more than I do. (laughs) Um, but I have a background in education and I love public schools, but it's not the right place for our kids. Mm -hmm. Um, our two youngest have some complex needs that have to, that need to be met, um, and some developmental considerations that don't necessarily jive with the expectations of a large public school classroom. And specifically my five-year-old, because my three-year-old is still three. Yeah. Um, we have but, one of those. We have one of those as well, yes. Um, he thinks he's not, but. Um, same, same thing. Yes. Same. <laughs> yes. So my five-year-old is wouldn't really mesh well or do well in a um, an inclusion classroom or a mainstream classroom. Um, he has a lot of sensory needs. He has a speech language, a speech disorder called apraxia, um, which is a motor planning disorder. It makes his spoken language very, very hard to understand, mm. um, less so than it was when he was much younger and even less so than it was six months ago. Awesome. But it still makes it very hard for him to communicate orally. Um, and he has a ton of sensory needs. So uh, in a mainstream classroom, a standard classroom would not be a good environment for him, but a self-contained classroom or a um, even mainstream with pull out into resource wouldn't meet his needs either. What I what is the uh, the pull out into resource? I, I, that's not a term I'm familiar with. Okay, so um, with special education, the idea and the goal of special education is always to place learners in their least restrictive environment. And the least restrictive environment is the most that they can do that benefits them. So resource would be, or pull out would be leaving the classroom and going to a special education teacher's classroom for a specific thing. Like you might you might have a pull out for, um, to work on phonics, or you might have a pull out for math skills or social skills. Mm-hmm. Whereas a self-contained classroom is going to be self-contained. They are children within the special education program who are primarily in a self con- a classroom that they are in all day. A lot of times they'll leave for their specials and go join an inclusion class for specials, but they're in that room. Um, those tend to be, those are generally kids who need the greatest amount of help, the greatest amount of accommodations. Resource is going to be, like I said, it's pulling out, is going to a special education teacher's room for a little extra help. Um, my five-year-old has a lot of sensory issues and a lot of sensory needs and the classroom 
is very, very uncomfortable with him for him or would be. Um, there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of background noise. But academically, his needs are going to be on par with a typically developing student. So mm-hmm. he has the same needs and trajectory academically as far as reading and math skills, but he may not be able to meet them in the same ways because accommodations that he needs to meet his sensory needs or his communication needs. Is this something that will continue? Like I, I have no understanding of any of this in my amateur questions. Is this something that he will work through sort of like a dyslexia thing, or is this something will he will always have to maintain through his entire education? So he's always going to have childhood apraxia okay. of speech. Okay. It, the childhood is kind of a misnomer. It, mm-hmm. He's always going to have apraxia. Mm-hmm. Whether his apraxia is always apparent, the degree of which it presents is going to change over time. And if we just look at him from two years old, where he had virtually no consonants at all, to now he's probably... 50 to 60% intelligible outside the family, he has definitely grown a great deal. Wow. Mm, that's great. And that comes through the, the, so you as a special education teacher were able to you know, provide him that one-on-one, you know, very you know, simple classroom uh, session. So you were able to be that teacher for him. And that was your main decision to begin to homeschool? As a parent, I'm able to be that teacher for him. Um, having the background in special education just let me know where to learn more about it. It gave me a little bit of a leg up on how to research and the legal ease that goes with it. Got I it. would imagine even as yeah. like a special education teacher, it's not like you learn about every single different type of issue a child could present, right? You still have to do a lot of probably individual research, even if you were in a classroom setting okay. about a specific need of each child, right? Yeah, every kid is different. Every kid has individual needs. And even among my my four boys, they all have different needs. All their needs are going to be different. With my two littles at home, they both have different needs. Um, just being at home means I'm only concentrating on two to four of them or three. <laughs> two to three of them at a time versus 27. So I'm his mom, first and foremost, and we learn, I just have a little bit easier time finding ways to help him. Absolutely. Is it is it common, he has the apraxia and then there's sensory issues, are those linked to the apraxia or is the, is it, is it uh, a separate, maybe a separate thing? Yeah. Like, is it common to have multiple different challenges at the same time? Um, With, with apraxia specifically, there are, are often a lot of cur- co-occurring disabilities with it. Um, sensory processing disorder is very, very common with apraxia. Auditory processing disorder is common as well. Um, dyslexia is very common. So that's actually something that we're specifically keeping an eye out for um, before it sneaks by. But a lot of times bec- they just, they go hand in hand. It stacks up like a layer cake. Mm-hmm. Like a layer cake. That must be that must be challenging. What kind of what kind of therapies and things? Uh, how how do you work with a child who has apraxia? So with my five year old, he does speech therapy and occupational therapy. He currently works with a speech language pathologist who specializes in AAC. We started working with her about nine months ago as he was growing out of his AAC um, because we wanted him to have greater access to conversational skills. And can you define AAC for our listeners? Oh, yes. Um, (laughs) So an AAC is alternative augmentative communication. It's a speech generating device. Um, For some AAC users, they use dedicated devices that are designed for and only for communication, um, be it direct access, pushing a button or pushing a screen with their finger. Um, some are going to use switches. Some are going to use eye gaze. Um, my five-year-old uses 
an iPad with an app on it because he has less access challenges that that meets the needs he has. So it's the kind of thing I imagine that would ramp right from, you know, when he's having a a really hard time making much communication, he's got lots of options of lots of things he wants to say with the AAC, but as he grows and gets more, more language skills, then he has less things that he needs to rely on it for, right? Is it tapered down? Uh, For him, it does. Um, For him, because it was provided, we provided it primarily to give him a way to communicate, to meet his needs because he had a lot of trouble with frustrations due to communication when he was a toddler. And because he is gaining greater length, greater speech and speech skills with the way that he's able to enunciate his words, he is using it less and less. And with him, he prefers not to use it. He will straight out argue with us that he is going to use his mouth. And we just need to listen better. (laughs) (laughs) But um, we still keep it around and we still do access it. And now that he's gotten older, we've made some changes to it. Um, Instead of being in his communication app all the time, which is for Loco to go, we actually have unlocked his iPad. And the only things on there are his communicate, his Loco to go, which is his speech app. A amazing app called Word Wizard, which is um, you move letter tiles, but the letter tiles give the phoneme like it says it as you move them. And then it it blends as you go. Hmm. Um, And he has the notepad on there and the messaging app. He likes to text his dad and his brothers. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But. Now he's gotten to the point where he very he doesn't use it very often. Mm-hmm. He, it is always available. And if he doesn't want to use her his or like even go find his, it's on my iPad. It's on my phone. Yeah. So he can just take my phone and open it if he needs it. Or there are a lot of times where we do can we do encourage him to use it mm-hmm. specifically for a word in a sentence or a phrase so he'll start talking and we'll like you'll understand everything he says until this word Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then we'll go can you repeat that again can you Mm -hmm. tell me this word and you try and you work through it and he tries to describe it and if it doesn't just work we're like here here's Mm -hmm. your here's your talker is the word on your talker no okay Mm -hmm. So what's the initial sound? Do you want to use your keyboard or do you want to use word wizard? Mm -hmm. What's your first sound? And we'll go through and sound it out. And if he's not, if he can't spell it, then we go through the sounds. And by then we can normally guess. And then we fill in the blank because we've already said, I heard you say A, B, C, D, but I didn't get F. Like, give me this word here, we get it, and then he keeps going. That's great. It's so neat that you have the portability of having it on all these devices. That's you don't have cool. to worry about carrying one specific custom unit around with you and not having it when you need it. Could you talk a little bit about the patience? I mean, what you're describing um, is requires a lot of patience, I think, and, and there's a lot of frustration you were talking about from your son. Um, were there a lot of challenges initially when you were beginning to do the home education um, that you had to like find within yourself. I, I know for me as learning to become an educator as a stay home dad who does home education, I had to learn a lot about myself. Was there something uh, that you realized um, along the way? Like you, I think in our, in our original, when we were talking to you offline, um, you said you had never had a classroom yet. So um, was this like a, a big moment for, for you as be, to become this educator to, to begin to work with your son? Was there a lot to overcome just personally um, and beginning to learn how to, you know, teach and, and move through these challenges. So I took a very long time to finish college, did great, graduated, and then, you know, life hits. Yeah. So yeah, it sure. took me a very long time to finish at university. I was in the schools for 10 or 12 years before I finally graduated. Um, but I was in the schools as a sub or working in some capacity. So I'd always been in education Um, I, after I graduated, 
which was right before my three and a half year old was born. Um, we just decided that it would not be the best time for me to go back to full-time employment. We were already, we had started to see a lot of the communication issues that my five-year-old was having while I was finishing my demonstration teaching, um, and had started with early intervention and getting him into speech. And just as we were seeing what needs he was going to have it didn't seem like the right time to go back. So I never went in with my own classroom and then the pandemic hit and (laughs) we were like, okay, (laughs) we're not going back right now. And as he's grown and as my three-year-old has grown and he's got, my five-year-old has gone through our local developmental pre-K program, which is the special needs pre-K. We have just decided that our public schools are not the best fit for him. It must have been hard to put your, after going through school for 10 to 12 years, right? Mm-hmm. To put your dreams on hold, all this hard work and say, you're putting the needs of your son ahead and staying with him. That must have been like, you know, you're doing the right thing for him, but it must have been challenging personally to put that that goal and that dream aside. Yeah. It was in that now... I do always have sometimes get that little background feeling of this is what I do. I'm a mom. Um, I'm a mom. You're professional mom though. You're professional, professional mom. Professional. Um, but at the same time, I'm really glad that I'm able to have this opportunity to help my kids grow and learn. Cause this is so it's fun. You never get to see kids in your classroom go through this. You don't get to start with them from the beginning and go all the way through. I'm not really sure that the classroom is necessarily the best environment for me anymore either. I'm not sure. I honestly have the patience for that. I have the patience for my kids because I can walk away. (laughs) Just a quick question about, you know, you know, one of the big things that I, I, I run into is trying to, to get up for the day, you know, and, and knowing that it is your kid, um, that is something that, you know, really inspires me. Is there, um, something that, that was the spark for you when you saw that he had those early, early issues that, that said, this is, this is like kind of a calling for you. Like you had done all this training up front. Was, was there a spark there that said, okay, this is something I want to do. And the question is, is this something you want to do with him all the way through? Is your goal to educate all the way through. Like I know Ariel and I have always talked about, we've always wanted to homeschool. Yeah. There was never a question whether or not we didn't. Um, we wanted to go the distance. Now that you have been, not in essence pulled into, but but deviated into the homeschooling world, is this something you're going to continue with your children, even though your other children went to the public school route and you were, it sounds like you were already angling to have a career in the public school. Now you're in the homeschooling. Do you anticipate going the distance with your with both of your children, your younger children? Uh, with the two youngest, we actually don't know at this point. Um, we definitely want to maintain homeschooling through elementary school, probably through middle school. I don't necessarily think it would be a bad idea to go all the way through high school. We um, we do have some underlying concerns with going through high school. And that's really only related to opportunities that they would only have in a school, like band, because we were band geeks. Oh, yeah. Word. <laughs> so I mean, like, how can I not give you band? Mm-hmm. Um, There's band or sports. There is that like, that's not something I can necessarily provide at home. And there are homeschool bands and homeschool orchestras or just community orchestras. It's not going to be the same as going every single day to class. Yeah, it is. It is a different experience. That's for sure. I agree. But academically, I think they actually almost have more opportunities with homeschooling because we can totally follow what they want to learn And I am completely open to whatever deep dives he takes off on as long as we can get our core skills in with it. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. 
So, so going, going back to the first part of Matt's question, I wanted to hear what that spark moment was for you when you realized you were going to, going to homeschool. Did it hit you one day that you were like, okay, this is it. I'm, I'm here for him. I'm going to do this. And because a lot of times people have preconceived notions about homeschooling. If they were not never, that was never an option for them. You know, what was that spark to change? You're like, this is actually an option for you. So it actually had always been something that we considered. It was just the thought that I would go back to work for four years to take care of loans and grants. And he would do kindergarten and first grade is I think about where the timeline would end. And then the baby who was at that time, the not even born yet, he would have not even gotten to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So the idea was he would go for a couple of years, but just seeing where his needs were and wanting to meet his needs and knowing that they, that couldn't be done in a large classroom environment was like that. This is how it's going to work. We're going to be here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a lot about your five-year-old. Can you tell us a bit about your three and a half-year-old? There's, there's, you have some learning challenges with your three and a half-year-old son as well. Is that correct? Uh, Yes. My three and a half-year-old, our entire family is as far as we can tell, in some way, shape, or form, neurodiverse. Mm-hmm. Um, our our older children, we have, with our oldest, we have one who is autistic, one who is, has ADHD. Um, I have ADHD <laughs> um, and sensory processing disorder. And we're talking like diagnosed in the 1980s as a girl with ADHD oh, that's, fun that, levels. Yeah, that's OG. Um, <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> So where my three and a half year old has a speech and language delay, we are, we are working with his speech and like his SLP, his speech language pathologist to tease out exactly what it is. Um, But he does have some speech expressive language delays. Um, He has some fine motor delays, but he also has the sensory sensory processing disorder as well, but his is kind of the opposite side of our five-year-old. So where our five-year-old is a little bit aversive sometimes to noises, our three and a half-year-old is crazy, loud, climby, jumpy child. Um, So sometimes one annoys the other a lot, which all siblings do anyways. And on purpose, exactly. they just, for them, we can go, dude, come (laughs) on. You know, your brother can't handle this. Can you not? Or can you please not tell your little, get your little brother to climb up on the counter to get you the marshmallows (laughs) off the third shelf because you know, he'll climb, but you're afraid of heights. (laughs) That's not fair. (laughs) So, so that must be challenging. So you've got two littles. I mean, it's hard enough having a five-year-old and a three-year-old, even without, you know, having any additional neurodiverse challenges. How do you, how do you manage both and, and then need it having completely different needs? How does that, how does that look? How do you, I mean, part of what we do with homeschooling is we kind of like cater to our, our, what our children need, right? It's that individualized education. How do you give individualized education when they, they both need something different and giving what one needs is the opposite of what the other can handle. How, how does that work? So right now with our younger one, not being at a school age yet, he's kind of just hanging out when we're doing our learning time. Um, he does join us during our beginning basket, um, which is like a morning basket in every other household. But we have to call it a beginning basket because my five-year-old says we it's not a morning basket because it's not morning anymore. <laughs> um, also, he doesn't want to basket. He doesn't want to do the morning basket. He wants to move on to wordly wise or um, science, and we're like, you know what? We have to begin with this. <laughs> this is our beginning basket. Um, so he's around for that. We do our calendar and. I just do it differently. Our five-year-old has an actual wall calendar, an undated one Mm -hmm. that every day we just sit down and we point together and we say today is Tuesday, February 23rd. 
And or yesterday was Tuesday, February 23rd. So today is, and then we know what today is, and he writes the date. And then lately he's been drawing a corresponding number block mm-hmm. for every day. Like, you know, oh. the BBC cartoon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, why? But okay, you do, you dude. <laughs> um, but my three-year-old has a laminated with Velcro sheet that says yesterday was Wednesday today is Thursday tomorrow is Friday and he moves the day of the week over so with that it's just meeting this is where he's ready for it doesn't take a lot of time difference um and with our beginning basket we're just we're doing readings so it's mostly reading the picture books that I want from other curriculum that I want to read in the morning when we're all together. Um, And I think my five-year-old has an Evan Moore geography workbook and a handwriting workbook. Um, And I have a couple like sticker puzzles and stuff in there. So my three-year-old has his own sticker by number puzzles Mm -hmm. that are a little bit more simple. And then my five-year-old has ones with 127 tiny little stickers on it to eventually Mm -hmm. make a velociraptor. Mm -hmm. And we've been working on this for like a month and a half. (laughs) Um, Because he gets kind of bored or forgets to do it. Um, Or we'll have like just some papers in there. Well, my three-year-old might color simple, big coloring pages where my five-year-old is going to color something a little bit more um it's more something more to his developmental level so that we do together other than that when we do reading when we do math when we do the actual activities for our science and social studies um he just kind of goes away so what kind of curriculums are you using for your science and social studies um so for science we are using scientific connections through inquiry Level zero, right, which is is the um like wrapper that makes building foundations for scientific understanding like uh, usable, usable, right? Right. Yeah. Oh, the, the green, the green book, the green yeah. book. Yeah, we bought the green, green book, book, and yes. I gave it to Matt because he's a physics major, and I was like, read this, and he was like, I'm Whoa. reading it. I'm like, I felt like I was having to analyze the tea leaves. I was like, well, okay, we got to go right from lesson here. So, and I, I think that wrapper is yeah. a, a good way to go. Yeah, the wrapper is really good. So, have you been enjoying that? We are. I'm loving it. He's okay with it um we weren't actually doing anything to start we started off our year completely unschooling because our preschool his preschool year was not the most awesome experience for him so we wanted a little bit longer time to disconnect that school from school at home Mm -hmm. um and he's we started co-op in the fall so it's his first time at co-op And then my husband had a total robotic knee replacement in November or October and was home from robotic knee replacement. They had a robotic thing that the robot did the thing with the the, the really wow. Wow. I feel that's so futuristic. I am not a science person. Like (laughs) I'm sure y'all with your physics and engineering could like to it's called a Mako. But the yep. the wow. robot did his up. knee replacement. Um, Amazing. It was very cool. That's awesome. But yep. it also put him home for eight weeks and had him in three times a week physical therapy, which when you join that with the kids therapy schedule and their co-op, we were very, very, very busy driving around a lot. So we did kind of a self-directed learning and he would tell us what he wanted to learn and I would find books and YouTube videos. We weren't on a schedule where we could like do this, this, this. So he did a complete deep dive into World War II fighter planes. Wow, oh, cool. Perfect. He's him. Yeah, that's um, awesome though. I know. So, but he then started, when we started to start back to school after Christmas, once dad was back at work and everything was calmed down a little bit, um, 
we would do our reading or we would do our math or we would do our wordly wise, which is a vocabulary program that he loves. Um, but, and he would say, I want to do science. And I'm like, okay. And I would grab a book and he's like, reading is not science. Oh, he wanted experiments. He wanted experiments. He wanted hands on mm -hmm. every day of the week. And <laughs> wow. That's a lot of supplies. <laughs> I did not have, I still, I don't, I do not have the available <laughs> working memory to get through this. So <laughs> I, don't think I would either. <laughs> um, so I went looking for a science curriculum and this one was recommended by within Torchlight and um, I think it came with a discount code for it too, but mm -hmm. I'd already been looking, looking at it. And I really liked how it doesn't <clears throat> focus on one branch of science for an entire year. Like, I really like how it does look at the biological sciences and the physical sciences, like physics and chemistry. And I really mm -hmm. like how it touches on everything for short two to four days. And then you move on. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. as a little, that helps give you a little bit more broader. It, I mean, it, it's like he's working on his, it's like he's a freshman in college. He's working on 1000 level courses here. <laughs> the um, kindergarten 1000 level yeah, courses. The kindergarten. So are you using that for science? And then so for social studies, are you going with Torchlight? For social studies, we are doing both Torchlight and... Um, build your library. I know nothing about this. No, <laughs> nothing at all. Um, at all. <laughs> well, that's fun. And then for and then for math, what what are you guys using for math? For math, we are using right right start. Um, mm -hmm. and we're starting at level I'm A. Sure, he loves that with all the hands on part of it. He is. He adores it. We just got to break out the geo boards a couple of days Ooh. ago because, like I said, it's a special time. Really late. <laughs> um he had he had so much fun with the geo boards that when we were done he's I'm like going to put stuff away he's like no I'm playing with this and then he made a guitar out of it but he loves the geo boards our three-year-old is obsessed with the abacus like he will come to the table during math time just to get to play with the abacus and not get in the way um otherwise we kind of sh I shoo him away and like there's Legos, there's a dollhouse, there's blocks, there's trains, go, there's a sensory table, go do something. <laughs> um, <laughs> math to do here. But he is loving, right? He's enjoying Right Start. We're going through it pretty quickly because mm -hmm. I started with the first level of everything and I'm a little bit regretting it. But at the same time, I don't think that he would have been ready for the next level. So we're just it's going hard through to know quickly and like touching it and mm -hmm. if we got it we got it we go if we don't then we stop and we work on it that is exactly how I, I approach it like even when you know there's a subject that we hit like time or money it's like oh my gosh I have hit this like seven or eight times now um you know here let's just do the the review at the end if you can pass the review right now i'm not going to do these six lessons yeah but she tests out of it i'm just like i let you test out of it and if if you can test out of it or if you if you can't okay great then let's go and and hit some hit some stuff but i really like how right start is structured in that kind of like eight or 15 20 lesson chunks and you can say okay well we haven't done this geometry section but we have done all this stuff before let me just see if mm -hmm. you can do the worksheet real quick if you can let's just move because I'm not going to waste a lot of time, especially with like Right Start. It's like 140 lessons. And it's like, oh There's my gosh. A it's, lot. it's a lot. It's a lot. It's like, yeah, I, I it's guarantee they are not going to be doing all this in the regular public school. There's no way. There's well, no way. Do you ever remember? I mean, just like totally up and slightly off topic. But do you ever remember ever in any level of public school finishing the entire textbook? No. Never. Never. Not a single year did we ever finish the whole textbook. We Never. would skip chapters and stuff because no one ever had time. It's kind of cool now. We, we know we got time for this. Maybe like AP classes because we had to hit so far for the test, but yeah, that was about it. Yeah. yeah. There's always at least something that got skipped. Yeah. And always. it's interesting now that we get to go through and, you know, if our kids know it, great, then we can move on. But yeah. we actually do the entire book. I'm always kind of wondering what was in the book that we skipped? Cause we skip stuff every year. No, there, you know, I, and I can see it, you know, in the right start and even in other subjects as well, I can definitely see there's a lot of things that you can leave on the cutting room floor and be like, eh, 
this is not super important. I, I don't, does, does my is daughter that a part of the tapestry of math? Well, though? Yeah, but does, does my daughter at seven years old need to know, you know, the difference between a rhombus and a trapezoid? I'm like, ah, this maybe, but let's move on. Like, let's, mm. you know, what hell, what hill am I willing to fall down on? <laughs> this week? I'm like, I'm going to move through. I'd rather get you to learn how to do addition and subtraction really well, you know, instead of hitting all these things. But that's, that's really interesting. I, I, lo I love to hear that you're, you know, you're able to adapt and change. Are you starting to find a flow and, and are you starting to see, um, are, maybe my question is, are you happy with all the curriculum choices you're making? A lot of parents will be shifting a lot of times trying to find what works perfectly is, are you, are you, are you happy with what you've had in over the last year or so, or are you going to be making pivots and changes going forward? Um, so basically so far with our curriculum choices, because we've really only been doing a set kindergarten curriculum for the past four months. Um, there really hasn't been a whole lot that we haven't liked or loved. Um, going back, I did when he was like three, I did buy the torchlight pre-K and I just couldn't handle it then. I had too much going on. We were in the early stages of learning devices and communication. I was just like, no, I can't do this. And then we went to break it out again over the summer. And I was like, this is really cool. I absolutely love this book and I like these cards, but I don't think we need this. We're just going to get bored or I'm going to get overwhelmed by craft supplies. And I don't want to do that because <laughs> I am not a crafty person. Glitter is not allowed in our household ever. No, same. no ever. Or slime. Or slime. Glitter or slime. We don't do any of those sensory tubs with rice. Oh, God. You no, know, we don't no, do any of that either. Yeah. I mean, we might Play be missing the boat. Plato is but... behind lock and key. Yeah. That has to be asked for. That's a privilege. <laughs> it's <laughs> not, not a right. Not a, not a right to access your Play-Doh. <laughs> but yeah. no, Grandma bought it for me. It's yeah, not your Play-Doh. Play Play-Doh lives in the laundry room. We it's... get it when we ask for it. And you get it handed to you on a tray. And that tray mm -hmm. travels with the Play-Doh. And that's where the Play-Doh lives while you play with it. Exactly. Yeah, very it Montessori. It does not come yes. off the tray. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to bring it back to me. It's like, it, we have to check it in and out. We <laughs> <laughs> have to check it. It's a lot of I love it. Um, it's, it's it's funny i mean we we jest right but it's hard because it can get know. messy not, and this is serious you know when you, you send your kids to school they get to do all the messy stuff at school but I you know here it's at our house that. it's like are we going to take on that's that? why I, we go to co-op well no listen right, so yeah i'm the janitor at the school okay <laughs> I, i'm the educator and the janitor You're underpaid. <laughs> i'm underpaid and i'm not happy with cleaning up messes so <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the co-op you mentioned that you go to co-op and i'm i'm curious how that's working for your family as far as interactions with the other kids and that being a, a quasi class setting and knowing that the public classroom wouldn't have been right for him how is how does co-op work and 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 how does that fit into your family and your homeschool so we started co-op in the fall. Our co-op lets, with the first child, lets you begin in kindergarten. If they have younger siblings, they have a pre-K or two pre-Ks and a nursery for younger mm -hmm. siblings, not by themselves. So the okay. first kid has to be in kindergarten. So we started with, he picked out his classes. The first term we did two, and he picked out nature art which mm. was cool because they're doing crafts there and nature yeah, walks best. and stuff. And I am also <laughs> not awesome at nature. So that just like filled two needs right there. Like they went on nature awesome. walks and they glued crumbly leaves to things. And, <laughs> um, and the other class he picked out was Ninja Life Hacks. Ooh. One oh, of cool. It's really cool. One of the parents, because it's parent led. Um, mm -hmm. one of the parents every term has been doing this for like five or six terms. She takes a stack and she cycles through so they don't even get all of them in one term of uh, the ninja life hack hack books. Um, mm -hmm. have y'all seen them? They're like no. excited ninja and happy ninja. It's all these executive function and emotional skills through these mm -hmm. little cartoony characters. Huh. And well, that's cool. It's they're interesting. It's nothing I would necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily buy it myself, but it was mm -hmm. great in a class with discussions. Um, as far as how he handles it, I go with him to his classes for mm -hmm. now until he is ready for me not to. Mm -hmm. Um, 
the parents at our co-op have to are volunteering the whole time they're there, but most of them aren't with their kids. They will have a lead te- lead and co-teacher in each classroom and then two to three other parents parent teachers in there who are just there to help um and then they have like door watchers they have someone sitting at each door so if one of the littles gets out of somewhere they don't like take off and get lost um but until he is ready and he says he wants to go by himself I go with him to classes and I stand in the back and that's about it I actually try not to interact if possible because I want him to be able to gain his independence on his terms. So Mm. if he is getting dysregulated, which watching I can see when it starts, then I can remind him, hey, if you need to ask for a break, we can ask, we can take a break. Or I might slip his talker onto the table closer um, to where he can see it and go, oh, yeah, this word. Um, Or I might slip a fidget in his hand. It's just kind of supporting him so that he can interact with the class. And he does great with classes, but his favorite time to be there is lunch. Um, So this, this spring semester, he picked out Magic School Bus, which is a science class based off of, they watch one of the half of Magic School Bus episode. And then they do an activity related to it. So like they've made blood and they made a stomach digestion in yeah. a bag thing. Yeah. Um, so he picked that out because he loves science. So he picked that yeah. out and then he picked out arthropods. Awesome. Um, oh, cool. Which one of the parents does and she uses... A purchase curriculum for it um and it's not a curriculum i would ever buy but they're little and she's not really reading the whole thing through and they look at bugs and they talk about bugs and he has fun but awesome. his favorite class is lunch because we go sit outside and we eat on the benches and then half the kids in the co-op are outside and they're like exploring the wood line So he's just out playing with other kids. So he has so much fun at co-op, but my three-year-old is the problem. Like (laughs) he is, he's a runner and he's not like escaping anything. He just wants to go explore. And he Mm -hmm. kind of forgets to inform you that he's going to explore. We have one of those. So my five-year-old will be out playing, walking with his own group. And every once in a while, he'll like come back and run back and go, mom, mom, I don't see brother. Where is he? And I'm like, he's right there. See, this is why we dress him in bright colors. And then he looks at him and goes, oh, okay. And goes back off. I want to like air tag mine because I just feel like. She does. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'm not sure where she is sometimes. Yeah. Well, in my she, own house. In our own house. Her, she's she's hiding under beds now. That's yeah, that's been really fun. We have a a ball pit and a tent. Oh, yeah. And they bury oh, themselves yeah. in the ball pit and then won't answer. Oh, great. That's, that's awesome. That's, that's super awesome. fun. So it sounds like the co-op has worked out really yeah. well. So his, his, his the speech difficulties because the apraxia doesn't seem like it's hindering him in this social environment. Do you think that, I mean... I don't know. Just remember my own experience. Kids are cruel, right? Kids are mean to other kids that aren't that that have different challenges. Do you think in this environment where it's more homeschool, it's parent supported, do you think this is a kinder environment than it would be if he were in a regular public school classroom without the kind of support that you're giving? I think it would definitely, especially towards upper elementary mm-hmm. and middle school, would be much much harder. It, kids are more inclusive than we give them credit for. Especially younger, yeah. Especially the young ones usually the, are. the primary grades, they are they're the ones who include their friends and make sure that they're that they feel special. Yeah. Um, it's not until it's around third or fourth grade, fourth or fifth, when kids start to notice differences more. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're less accepting. And it's just because it's a developmental thing, they're noticing differences and they're also building their own social hierarchy. Um, I think it would be harder for him in a public school 
because of his communication differences. And it does take him longer to answer sometimes because he has to really think about what he's saying. Apraxia is a motor planning disorder. So it's actually based off, it's basically his brain is not sending the right signals to make his mouth move in the right way. Okay. So sometimes he takes a little bit longer to answer because he's planning out those movements. Um, hmm. And then sometimes when he's talking a lot and really excited, he forgets to plan them out. And that's when everything gets jarbled. Hmm. Um, so I think it would definitely be harder for him when he's older. Whereas with homeschooling and with the co-op, we are in smaller smaller groups. We are in a more relaxed environment and our co-op is very neurodiversity friendly. Mm -hmm. There are, it's great. And just differing, um, very disability friendly. There are Mm -hmm. a lot of kids with different developmental disabilities and neurodiversities and health differences just within our co-op that Mm -hmm. most of these kids are used to seeing are used to interacting with kids who are different for them at co-op it's normal. And we really Mm -hmm. like that. And we like that with the co-op, it gives him the opportunity to do more that we can't do with just homeschool. So while it's not always my favorite curriculum choices, aren't always my favorite Mm because it's not a secular co-op. It's not a religious Mm -hmm. co-op, but they're not restricted to secular materials. They are very supportive and they are definitely a community. And it gives him some Mm -hmm. opportunities as he gets older because they have a 4-H club and they have a beta, they have beta club at the elementary and middle school and high school level. So Mm -hmm. it gives him those kind of opportunities. Oh, that's That's amazing that you found that out, that outlet there. And and we use our parent partnership for very similar reasons, you know, being able to, Mm -hmm. you know, have classes that we otherwise could support here in the house or giving them that, uh, that experience of meeting other children and playing and having all that fun thing, the clubs, finding interest. uh, That's been a real big, I think a big find for us. Is there kind of a pivot question in your homeschool? We always have a fun little question. We always try to ask everyone, um, is there something that you have, um, that you can't live without. Now, obviously, you you have your tablet and all the technology around your son. Um, is there something that you guys have that in your homeschool, a rolling cart of some sort, or some? I, I think in the last interview we had a, uh, a very special piece of furniture that that was like a an organizer and and baby changer. At the same time. Yeah, those are uh, those are go to. Uh, do oh. you have something that you can't live without? So that gigabit internet connection is not a valid answer. No, that is is a very valid answer. Yes. Uh, Honestly, it really is. I mean, I do have my homeschool cart that I absolutely love. I got one, finally got the big target one. Um, And that holds our, um, the whole top of it holds our spines and our current country um, Mm -hmm. for our social studies. And then the next level down holds everything else. Um, But no, seriously, the internet, it gives me, we have YouTube has so many options now and we use, I mean, we use Spotify. He loves, both my kids are obsessed with podcasts. Like that's that's a major thing for them. Um, And do you you have a recommendation of podcasts for for that age range? What, What do you like? Um, they love who smarted. Um, they really love just the zoo of us and that's not mm-hmm. actually a four kids podcast, but they really enjoy it. Um, they were into greeking out for a while and now they're kind of bored with it. Um, my five-year-old listens to world of war birds because mm-hmm. we like those old airplanes. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. but a lot of times it's just, what does he want to learn about? Um, he That's went amazing. through a puffin phase. So we were finding everything we possibly could everywhere on puffins. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just the internet. It it has everything and a library card. Like, <laughs> I couldn't do it. I couldn't afford. Okay, not by homeschooling is expensive as it is. 
No, yeah, it's that's incredibly true. expensive. Like, like I mean, I, it, it okay. can be very cheap, and it can be very, but you know, the opportunity cost aside, they get me yeah. on uh, there's the materials and stuff. They always yeah. get me, and I'm I I you of can course. be enticed to spend a lot. <laughs> you can do it on a little, but you can be very enticed to spend a lot. It'd be hard to do this affordably without. I mean, you could do it, but it's hard to do it without a library card. I mean, I, I don't know how you could oh, without a library card, you I don't prioritize know buying spines and what. I mean, I think with like you know the around the world journey or the the, his, the prehistory thing that we're doing now, we could get away with getting like one spine and staying with it. But we we like to jump around and try different yeah, books book and stuff, and we're book here, consumers though. not just for the podcast, but just in general. I think we would still do that anyways. Yeah, and really I don't know how it. how we could do it without the library. I, I just we're, we're we're power users at the library. Yeah, and, like, but we are. Yeah, we're kind uh, of even addicted. just like audiobooks too. Like our daughter loves. To, like you said, your son loves to listen to Spotify. Mine, mine is addicted to audiobooks. Like that's her thing. And it's like mm-hmm. I couldn't imagine dropping fifteen dollars for every single you know Wings of Fire audiobook. I just I couldn't afford it. It's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, we haven't hit Wings of Fire yet. We are on. We just finished book three of Zoe and Sassafras, and yep. we are oh, waiting yeah. for Those book good. four on the reserve on Libby. Um, Mm -hmm. And I'm a little bit regretting not buying the whole series (laughs) in paper. (laughs) Um, But we'll get there. They're such cute illustrations, but you could maybe get the Kindle version from the library and they could look at the pictures while listening. So that's an, that's an idea because there are cute pictures. So we're actually, we're getting the, we get the Kindle version for that from the library. Um, They, we read it together that we've been doing Zoe and Sassafras at bedtime because mm-hmm. there's too much going on during the day. So we do that <laughs> at bedtime and we'll do a couple, three chapters, but they're up in our big chair in their room. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have it on my iPad and I turn on the ruler that Kindle has built in. So mm-hmm. I'll actually run the ruler down or my five-year-old will take his turn and he'll move the ruler as I go through each line so they can follow where I'm at. Yep. And he really likes that. He thinks that's cool. And I think that's really helping because he'll track what we're doing in a picture book. You're looking at one or two lines. That's not overwhelming in a whole chapter book, even though he probably could read most of the words independently, you put all that together and it's just too much. So that reading ruler on Kindle is amazing. Mm-hmm. It's um, good to know. And yeah, we 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 love our library. Absolutely. So so this is your, you know, since it's a kindergarten, this is your first year homeschooling. Um how, how do you feel how do you feel about how your first year has gone? Do you, I mean, obviously it it probably started a little bit differently than you planned. Your husband has this knee surgery and so you have to unschool a bit. Now you're you're switching gears, you're doing all this curriculum. You know, what's been your overall impression of getting started? Um, so it actually almost feels like two first years Mm -hmm. because we did essentially unschool last in the fall and that I had never considered unschooling because I am a planner and I like to be organized and I like to know what's going on. I know nothing about this. (laughs) Nothing. (laughs) So I had never considered unschooling, but it was just really right then It was kind of a great point to let him go. Now, this was not abnormal or this wasn't different than his Mm -hmm. normal state of being. He did this before he technically hit kindergarten. It's just now we're calling it school and logging in. (laughs) Um, I love that natural progression. You know, that's how we kind of how we felt too. Like it just kind of, you just kind of slid into it now. And now with curriculum. (laughs) Yeah. And this is when we started adding curriculum, we did add it very slowly. We added Mm -hmm. one at a time and we started with wordly wise, which is a vocabulary, explicit vocabulary instruction. Um, And he just took off. He loves that. Mm. Um, So that one's really expensive, but we're probably going to have to keep doing it because he likes it and he asked for it. So I will do (laughs) things that he asked for. Um, So we started with Wordly Wise and then we added on um, our Logic of English, our Right Start. And then we added on our Logic of English. And then he decided that we needed to do a science. Mm -hmm. And 
then I got, he kept telling me where all these countries are on the map. And we needed to talk about more than just the fact that these are countries. So Mm -hmm. I don't, I didn't want to leave it just identification. I want to get into the culture and the history. And I like the idea of starting with geography before we even touch history. So we can look at the people and where they are now and physically where they are. And we're probably just going to end up doing it for like the next three and a half, four years because I have a three and a half. It's good enough. So yeah, you're gonna have to go. We're gonna be doing it again in like another year and a half. And I don't regret. And I'm I'm looking forward to doing it again. My three and a half year old is a late birthday. So Mm -hmm. he's technically isn't in three years. He won't be in kindergarten technically until he's about to turn six. That's Mm -hmm. probably not gonna cut it for him. Right. We're probably gonna actually start kindergarten around four and a half. Um, because that looks like that's where his needs going to be, especially since he's Mm -hmm. been watching brother and Mm -hmm. the most that I can combine for them looks like a good idea. Mm -hmm. Like the least amount I have to do separate would probably give way to my head, not exploding as quickly. (laughs) Yours are tight enough that it's going to be probably an easy thing. We're we're just like one step from Yeah, ours are three and a half apart, but we're still going to do it. We're still going to put them on the same level as soon as the, we're going to just put them on the track of the younger one's age. Yep. And then, and just add on, add on. It's easier to add on than take away. It's easier to make it more complex than it is to, yeah, pare it down. So, so looking forward into the future, um, you know, you've, you've done kind of two years, you're getting into it. You've got this plan going forward of how you're going to incorporate your three and a half year old and move forward. What, what challenges are you, are you thinking might come up that you're worried about? I know there's things that, that I have personally that I'm thinking like, man, I'm, I, I know I'm worried about this challenge. Or I think this is going to come up and how would we tackle this? So there's, are there things that are on your mind as you go forward that you're kind of trying to prepare for? Yeah. I think math might be a challenge. Cause I don't, I never excelled at it. Mm -hmm. Um, I got through, I passed and (laughs) I got through my college classes and passed through my college classes, but I'm not a math teacher, which was another big reason for choosing right start is because I love the way that they teach it and start from numeracy and the con like number theory, um, and then move on to doing the math but math is going to be hard once we get past middle school um for right now I'm not looking that far because I'm scared to and I (laughs) will plan out his entire next 11 and a half years of schooling given the opportunity so I have to stop myself from going too far in the future of planning um but I think math is going to be one of our bigger challenges I do want to add on Beast Academy soon and give him that opportunity to look at math in a more abstract manner mm-hmm. and add in the critical problem solving. Mm-hmm. And I think adding that on will help him as he gets to the level that he's going to be doing it more independently, or I have to pay someone to tutor him or them. It's always an option. It's probably going to be a good one. <laughs> yeah. um, just getting through and as they grow, finding Everyone always says that people ask them, what about socialization with homeschoolers? Well, how do they socialize? And I understand, like, I understand the concept and I agree with the concept that school is not for socialization. You don't socialize in school. You do meet your friends that are in the neighborhood on the bus, though. So there is kind of that aspect of it, of it is harder for them to just meet kids that they can disappear and go play with and come back when the lights come on. Um, But, and extracurriculars aren't really anything that they can necessarily be involved with yet. Um, Just to meet my five-year-old specifically for his sensory needs and his need to regulate they're really, it's really hard to get him involved in extracurriculars where he can meet other kids because it's just a lot. And so hopefully as they grow older, they'll have an easier time meeting kids. And when they can just like go roam the neighborhood, 
which mm-hmm. they can't do yet. <laughs> um, they'll meet more kids their age to play with beyond me having to schedule play dates because mm-hmm. that's a lot of scheduling. It is. <laughs> yeah, it is. Especially it really when is. their friends go to school. Like no, that's you know, a really like, hard thing when they're it's a ghost town around here when during the day. Yeah. Right. It's, it's just us. It's just us. It's like there's no other kids. And yeah, then, but it's it's kind of fun to go to the grocery store and see the other parents with school other, age kids and you like nod, store. you're like, hey, hey, you know, you're walking around with your seven year old like, hey. Because <laughs> we you, you know. Friends that their kids do go to public school. And when they have a day off, like an in-service day or a holiday, they're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, yeah, right. um, we have school. And they're like, but it's a day off. And I'm like, no, oh. if yeah. he's in the mood to go sit down and do it, yeah, we're going to do it. Because yeah. if he needs those off days, I want build up. Like, mm-hmm. I, I want to have it built up that we don't go. Oh, I'm behind. Even though you really can't get behind, I don't. If he yeah, wants but there's to, a mental thing there. If he wants to school, I'm gonna go school. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I think that I think that's all. Yeah. This has all been just really great. Uh, I really en- really enjoyed talking with you. What what I want to know is, you know, we have some other parents of neurodiverse kid kiddos that are just getting started. They're thinking like maybe homeschooling is what they're gonna do. What what would you tell them? about, you know, about getting started, what would your advice be? Think about what your kids need. Mm -hmm. Don't listen to anyone else who tells you that a classroom of 30 is going to be best for them or that a classroom of seven is going to be best for them. Think about your kid, your child or children and their needs and do what you can and you're able to to meet their needs in the best way to help them grow. And if their needs are best met in an inclusion classroom with extra supports, and that's their best way to learn, and you're happy with that, then that's best. But if your child needs or would benefit from anything different, do what your child needs and what you need. Mm -hmm make sure that you're on board and you're supported so that you can support them. That's I mean, great advice. Yeah, I think it's great. I think it would, you know, I can imagine it would be difficult to have a, you know, a toddler and, you know, get into preschool and realizing that, you know, we, we have another, you know, we have a special challenge here and where do I go? Do I put them in preschool? Do I start mm-hmm. kindergarten? Do you, would you recommend that they, they test some things out to know? Cause I, I would fear like, I wouldn't know how my child would thrive best. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really depends on the child and the family. We did test out pre-K, not because we were necessarily thinking about it. Um, At that point, we're like, we don't think it'll be best once he gets elementary. But Mm -hmm. when my five-year-old started pre-K, I had a one-year-old at home who had just, you know, he was busy. I was like, awesome. He can go one day a week and have fun and play and maybe not necessarily learn skills, but learn being away from home and playing and enjoying. And I can have a day to focus on the baby Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. my five-year-old had a lot of needs and the baby does too, but sometimes one of their needs overshadowed the other one. Um, yeah. so it was with pre-K, we sent him to our public pre-K with the expectation that he's going for a day to have a day to himself. And I was getting a day with brother. It worked for us. Some people just need to get through that pre-K period because yeah. Yeah, sometimes period. that pre-K is just crazy. It is crazy, mm-hmm. um, and that's and that's ex- that's exactly what we do. We send our our three and a half year old to uh, preschool, um, twice two, a, days a two days a week, and we we try to align that with the days. My daughter's at the parent partnership as well, and that's more to handle my psyche, um, <laughs> to allow me to get a little bit of time, um, just to kind of you know ground myself and be able to do things that I want to do and and 
and keep myself you know excited Same. about yeah and then <laughs> i think the summer we've chosen to extend that through the summer as well there's an option at our preschool to go through the summer as well and we're going to do the same thing and what's great about that is going to give me two days a week where i can you know solely focus three straight hours with my older daughter and i can accomplish a lot of homeschooling in that time frame and then that would open up the rest of the week to be a little bit more enjoyable a little bit more free form and you know designing your schedule especially with the preschoolers i know it was really challenging when you know my youngest was like a little glowworm and you know i was having to you know nurse her and put her down for multiple naps during the day and then trying to homeschool you know a four and a half year old five year old just getting started with homeschooling uh, doing early kindergarten stuff and it was it was a challenge but once she became a toddler and she was kind of starting to play and toddle around was it was a little bit easier but now it's hit this like apex where I'm getting 50,000 questions a day from the three and a half year old about what I'm trying to teach my seven year old seven and a half year old and it's just like oh my god I got you got to give me a break kid so yeah it's nice to off offshore that to another school <laughs> you get that school. point sometimes you need a break once they can climb out of the playpen and they're climbing the counters that you're oh just my god. you need a break it's um, a very but, but but what's fun about it is this next year my youngest because she's that the way her birthday's falling is she's going to be in kindergarten, not this coming year, but the following year. And so I'm like a year and a half away from having both kids at the parent partnership. And I'm like, oh, this is so exciting. I don't have to drive to two locations. I only have to go to one. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. <laughs> so thanks well, to look forward to. Thank you so much, thank Jenna. You. Is there anything else you'd like to, to leave us with for, for parents or um, anything else that we didn't cover? Um, no, I think I don't really think so just really the whole meet your kids where they are and help them grow to where they're going to be, but do it in a way that's right for your family. Make sure that you have the support to do it and then do what's best for everyone. It's not going to look the same as people on Instagram, but it's going to be what's right for them. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us today and making us a part of your homeschool journey. Please engage with us on social media. Join our Homeschool Together podcast group on Facebook and find us at Homeschool Together podcast on Instagram. We'd love to hear your feedback, questions, and recommendations. Until next time. Happy homeschooling!